in New Zealand and I teach part-time, um, sort of a pretend academic. I used to be full-time academic, but um, I've since worked for government and done other things. Um, so what, I'd, what we're going to do for today's panel, I'm going to, um, I'm going to first give just a couple of minutes, very um, high level overview of the topic. And then I'll ask the panelists to each introduce themselves. The panelists will each then give a fairly short sort of presentation seven or eight minutes, something within that um, time frame. And I've got some questions for the panelists. I think hopefully they've got some questions for each other. Um, but rather than waiting until the end for audience participation, because we do have a small group, I think we're really keen as soon as they've done the presentations that we can just make this more of a conversation and you know everyone participates. Um, and perhaps when you ask questions, you know you can let us know your name so that we all get to know each other. Um, so just by way of background and apologies for people who know all of this, but I think for me it's just helpful to really think about the topic, which is food security versus food safety, like kind of what does that mean? So I know I've been trying to sort of think how these things fit together. Um, and, it, and it does feel to me like traditionally, they've been sort of traditionally um, dealt with separately in international trade law. So if we look at food security, I guess in simple terms, um, this refers to the availability of food and people's access to it. And I think it's really caught, you know, the world's attention, um, in particular following the pandemic and then with, you know, the war in Ukraine. Um, and so, you know, as we saw during the, the pandemic, um, in particular, certain measures that countries introduced out of concern for food se um, security, such as export controls, um, and also to provide financial support um, for domestic producers who had been impacted um, by COVID related shocks. Some of those measures really threatened to disrupt and distort international um, agricultural production and trade. Um, food security is an ongoing topic um, you know, for the WTO. Um, at MC12 last year, there was um, one particular outcome on food security, a ministerial decision on the World Food Programme, um, food purchases and an exemption from export prohibitions or restrictions. But obviously, that's just the tip of the iceberg, you know, there's, there's many, many issues remaining. And then on food safety, I mean, the term food safety, I guess, just refers to whether food is safe to eat, you know, is it free from contaminants, toxins, diseases? etc things that might have a negative impact on human health it's primarily really dealt with through the SPS agreement and also the TBT agreement um, and both of those agreements put disciplines on WTO members in terms of how they regulate um, as we all know food safety measures can really become a source of trade tension often simply because countries different countries have different levels of protection um, with reference to different risks um, and often different different populations have differing perceptions of risks what you know is what populations could consider acceptable in one country might not be acceptable in another country. And as um, technology develops, really fascinating questions around food safety are, are arising. And I think food safety, I studied, um, did my PhD back in the early 2000s, and it was a really big issue then with the EU US GMO case. And it felt, and there was a lot of academic discussion at the time, and it felt like things, at least to me, felt like things sort of went a bit quiet for a while. But now, as Marcus is going to talk about in particular, we have some really interesting and um, cutting edge new technologies. And so it seems like this topic is really going to rear its head again. And I guess when we think about food security and food safety, um, there's some really interesting crossovers. Obviously, food security is critical. The world's going to need more food as the population increases. So how should we be thinking about regulating production of food, especially where we, where we have these new kinds of food which hold out you know, the promise to provide the ability to feed the world, to provide the nutrition we need, but potentially have these risks um, or you know, where people are maybe very concerned about these new technologies. Um, so that's sort of some of the, the crossovers. Hopefully we'll find more connections, um, particularly also with the, the presentation around food, um, uh, sustainable food production, which really um, gets at the heart of this connection. So now, anyway, I'll turn over to the panelists. Um, if perhaps we can run through first, just have everyone introduce themselves, and then we'll, we'll get to the presentation. Well. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Miguel Rabagodor Becker. I'm a professor of law in CIDE, which is a research center in Mexico City, public research center. And I'm mostly focused on areas of international law and legal theory. And I come from a different tradition. I used to work in international economic law, but I find myself as an interdisciplinary critical 
scholar maybe, or <laughs> scholar. Uh, my name is Marcus Wagner. I just recently got out of jail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm actually not kidding. Um, wrongfully imprisoned, I should say. Um, I thought that, that you had a shop in Florida. Yeah, well, I don't. That's the other. That's the other Marcus <laughs> yeah. Wagner that they should have. That they should have. Um, <clears throat> no, uh, I, should, I can't really say seriously because all of that happened. Right? Um, so my name is Marcus Wagner. I am the executive vice president of Steel. Uh, I'm actually very happy that you're all here. I'm also happy I'm here, uh, and I'm uh, associate professor at the University of Wollongong, Australia, uh, where I deal mostly with international economic law and governance. I do say both right? uh, because I think we need to think much more beyond narrow confines of whatever legal text. Uh, we have in front of us, uh, and, and uh, if anything, the last two weeks have shown me that you need to think about law in terms of getting me out of jail. Um, you need to think about law, not just in the narrow confines of say criminal law, but also of how you get someone out, right? And what levers you need to pull in order to make this happen. And I don't think, uh, I'm not think, saying that, the, that, that we as lawyers don't have a part, a role to play. I think we have an important role to play. And we need to make that clear to the other disciplines, right? And so that the project here uh, that I'm going to be presenting on, uh, on, on cultivated foods, uh, which might mean nothing to you yet, um, is, is part of that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vishakha Srivastava. Uh, I work as a senior research fellow at the Center for WTO Studies in New Delhi, India. So uh, what my center does is uh, we advise the government of India, the primarily the Ministry of Commerce and Industry in trade related matters. I primarily work in uh, non-tariff measures, SPS and TVT measures, and also in areas such as uh, trade and sustainable development and national security measures. It's nice to meet you. Hi everyone, I am Asutos. I work as a research fellow at the Center for Trade and Investment Law, New Delhi, India. My primary job is to advise government of India on various policy matters. Other than that, I also take part in ongoing various ongoing negotiations, which India is a party to. And very recently, I'm part of IPEF supply chain agreement also. I'm very excited to present in front of all of you and look forward to interesting questions. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we'll turn now to Miguel. Okay. I have a small image in my presentation. Just a disclaimer, when I'm not a professor of law, I want to be a performance and visual artist. Or <laughs> 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 uh, well, my presentation is called a Mexican Counterpoint between maize and sugar, a chronicle of the sweet you know? First, you have to go to this guy, no? Fernando Ortiz. Fernando Ortiz was a Cuban um, anthropologist. He wrote this book in the 30s, no? And it's called Contrapunto Cubano del Tabaco y del Azúcar, which is Cuban counterpoint of tobacco and sugar. And it's basically a history of Cuba from two crops, no? And I tried to steal this idea. I mean, Fernando Ortiz is one of the great anthropologists in, in the University of Heidelberg. You have a center based on his uh, concept he developed, which is basically transculturality, no? And I tried to take this idea of the counterpoint, which is a musical term in which you have various voices, various voices, instrumental voices, and as Bach did wonderfully, you try to combine, you try to uh, make harmony out of those different points. You know? And he tells the story of Cuba through sugar and through tobacco. And he counterpoints it basically, uh, just doing a basic introduction, that sugar is the massive uh, slavery, uh, plantation economy that we all know, and there's a lot to say about that, no? And tobacco is kind of this fine artistry measure in which the Cuban uh, culture is represented more closely, but both are part of the Cuban culture. So it's a very interesting book, I recommend it a lot. My point is that, at least in the recent trade disputes with the US in <clears throat> agriculture, sugar and corn would play that part, that count. So that's, that's the analogy, no? And what are those sweet words? It sounds better in Spanish, no? But uh, basically the US and Mexico have a very integrated market, as you know, and it's being integrated even more. Food issues are 
high up in the agenda of the Biden administration. They're also in the decree, the presidential decree, which they're being national security after the COVID pandemic, no? And which is the market which is gonna provide or which can provide in any uh, uh, crisis arriving, uh, Mexican market seems to be. But it's, well, Mexico is also an importer of great important agricultural products, especially corn. So with sugar, you kind of have a dispute that runs alongside the interest of the sugar industry in Mexico, which basically wants to produce sugar for soft drinks, because we are also a country which uh, consumes, uh, sadly enough, for all of patients of diabetes like me, you know, uh, a lot of sugar and a lot of uh, uh, high high fructose. No? So, which is why there's Mexican co cola in, in, in the US. I don't know what which is the, supposed to be different. I don't know. I haven't right. had a Coca Cola in years. First, for ideological reasons, and then for <laughs> <laughs> health reasons. But, but it's supposed to be better. No? So that's the thing. And there's a special market. So. And also, I mean, the, the, health, the health industry in Mexico and the, the, the Office for Consumption and everything have been very keen on, on pointing out to sugar, high sugary beverages as part of a health, national health problem. So the, the thing is that we have, I tried to bring an anthropological perspective to all of this and a legal geography perspective in which we don't have just the disputes regarding the big industries or the arbitration panels under chapter 11 of NAFTA, which have now been basically uh, changed into a SMECA, no? But you also have in the dumping measures and the World Trade Organization uh, panels and appellate decision on sugar, no? And, and uh, sorry, on high fructose, no? And also the, the disputes and, and negotiations around sugar and around corn, but you also have the impact on, on the right to food and health in Mexico. Another thing that, that struck me and why I was compelled to start working on this uh, project since I was more leaning on legal theory in other areas is because 10 years after NAFTA, I think this was in 2004, 2005, I'm not sure, I saw Jaime Serra Pucho, which was, who was the chief negotiator of NAFTA for the Mexican counterpart, then Secretary of Commerce, and then a very not very well remembered Secretary of Finance who brought us into one of the biggest uh, financial crises in 1984. And then there's no, um, no policy of, of uh, call it, uh, rotating, uh, rotating, uh, rotating door policy in Mexico. So he became to the private sector. He's a prominent member of a very uh, well-known legal firm, which concentrates most of the litigation of NAFTA and SMECA now. <laughs> So he said, corn was not important in the negotiations in that. 10 years after, when corn was domesticated in Mexican soil, when corn is part of the basic staple of food, when milpa, which is a traditional agricultural uh, way of growing corn around other, uh, other uh, products, uh, beans, chili, uh, squash, um, other things, quilites, other things you may are the basic staples of food in Mexico. And also, when we are having as Peru, a new dimension in Mexican gastronomy in which maize, not corn, maize, is uh, very important and is becoming like a gentrified way of tortillas and, and maize. No? So, I mean, it, it, I was compelled to answer to this uh, very blatant uh, remark, which he still, I think, defends. And, and just a quick comment. He was in the same government that uh, a very noted Mexican anthropologist, Arturo Barman, was the Secretary of Agriculture, and his PhD thesis was on the importance of maize in Mexican culture throughout Mexican history. So I think you should know it. No? But still, the thing is that this counterpoint in trade measures and just when there has been in the two, in 2000, in the early 2000s, there's another recent history story. No? The Fox administration, which was the first uh, presidency, which wasn't uh, by the Free Party, which came after several electoral reforms, but was right wing leaning, no? did something which is very strange for a right wing government, expropriated all the sugar industry in Mexico in 2001. And that uh, was done because high fructose products, especially in the soft drink industry and processed food sectors, 
were basically destroying the sugar industry in Mexico. And also uh, the trade restrictions of the US, formal and informal, were also uh, destroying the sugar industry. So he nationalized it, and that in turn became, uh, it, it was also accompanied by a new tax law regarding high fructose, and also by a restraint and quota restraints on high fructose imported from the US. So this is the start of the sugar wars, or the sweet wars, whatever you want to call them, in which we had uh, WTO panels, uh, appellatory decision, we had chapter 20 of NAFTA uh, panels, we had five, no, four, sorry, uh, chapter 11 arbitrations regarding the expropriation decree, regarding the taxing, the, the increase in taxing and the quotas, no? also as proprietary measures for US companies, including uh, Midland Archer, including uh, other uh, big food companies against Mexico. Some of those cases, especially, strangely enough, the expropriation cases were won, but the ones of the tariff quotas and the uh, tax systems were lost. Uh, Accumulating, I don't know, 150, 160. So I'm just trying to, to tell you the, the importance in terms not only of food security versus uh, other, other versus free trade, no, versus other things, but also adding the dimension of probably food sovereignty, which now the government has two decrees in the last months in which it has basically. Uh, uh, basically uh, introduced a, a tariff of 50% for white corn, first, I'm sorry, yellow corn, and then white corn. The difference between white corn and yellow corn in Mexico is that yellow corn is used for uh, animal stock, and white corn is used for human consumption directly. Mm -hmm. in, uh, parts of no? So I leave it there because, uh, sorry, it's a very complicated story, but just to give you a brief panorama wanted to talk about. This is a translation. Please. Thank you very much, Miguel. And I'm sure we've all got lots of questions, but we're, we're going to do each of the presentations and then we'll get into the discussion. Um, so, hand over to Marcus. Um, all right. All right. Um, if anyone wants to do uh, any of these uh, thingies, then feel free to go to my LinkedIn account, my Twitter account. If you're not following me already. Right so um, I'm going to talk about something that I came across less than a year ago, just roughly a year ago. And, um, let me ask you, if, if you look at cultivated foods in international trade law, right, uh, towards achieving uh, food security and civil development, nice title, don't really care about it. Who knows what cultivated foods are? Any, 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 guess, any guesses, right? <laughs> so, so, is this like making meat themselves in the lab and stuff, not actually using animals to create this animal fiber? Yes, all right. So it's it's sometimes some, sometimes referred to as frankenfoods, lab meat, uh, all sorts of things. All right. So the the overarching term is cellular agriculture, and I'm going to focus on cultivated foods. Did you include dairy in that? Like milk? I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Sorry, but yeah, Sorry. I'll get to that. But the answer is yes. All right. Um, so. Cellular agriculture is sort of the overarching term, and underneath that you have cultivated food, and you have what's most often called precision fermentation. Precision ferment, yeah, but the funny thing is milk straddles both, right? Precision fermentation basically uses fermentation techniques that we've known for quite a while, but they're also highly sort of uh, laboratory-based uh, exercises in which you create precursor materials to other products, right? So you create the proteins, essentially. Um, um, and so there you could have milk powder that or precursor materials. Milk powder, for example, created simply by um, a bacteria, right? So the secretion of bacteria come out. And I know it sounds really awful, uh, and I'll tell uh, people in, in a moment why I'm so fascinated by all of this. So that's cellular agriculture, which I'm not going to deal with very much. I can talk about it if you want. I'm going to talk about cultivated foods, right? And this is what, as Meredith has said, um, you. And I'll go into that uh, in a moment. So let me just uh, start here, which basically is a very brief introduction um, of what I'll be talking about. Uh, but I want to start off uh, really with this, right? What are the challenges to food security that we're facing? And the reason why I want to show this is because we, number one, still have a growing world population. And we not only have a growing world population, right? 
which you can see here. But we, we have a growing world population at various, these are various projections, even the low ones are still telling us there's a growing world population until about 2050, right? So we still have about 25 years, 27 years uh, of growing populations. And if the higher ones are bearing things out, right, then we're, we're, we're actually in quite serious trouble. Uh, if the middle ones are bearing uh, things out, we're still growing up until like 25. <coughs> now, you combine that, not only with a growing world population, but you could combine that with a growing desire of that growing world population for proteins, right? Um, once you combine those two things, we're finding ourselves, uh, from my perspective at least, uh, in, in quite a quagmire. Uh, quagmire with respect to effluents that come from animal husbandry, uh, a quagmire with respect to the uh, methane and CO2 production that at least traditional live uh, stock rearing brings about. Um, I don't think anyone else lives in Australia at this point, but there is a burger chain uh, that is called Grilled, and they're advertising at the moment that most of their beef products are being fed uh, with kelp. Um, and that reduces the CO2 output already significantly. But that's nothing in comparison to what the overall numbers are. Um, and so if you think about that population growth, I just point out that to you, if you think about the, the protein consumption patterns potentially doubling by 2050, right? In addition to a growing population. Um, and if you look about the very, very unequal uh, distribution of meat consumption and the growing desire for meat in places that traditionally have not had a whole lot of meat, then you're, it's sort of a ticking time bomb. Um, um, so certain consequences you see behind me, uh, I think there's the one thing I would focus on is political or draw your attention to is political disputes, uh, both domestically and internationally. Um, uh, the low level conflict to war, I can, I can perfectly see it. Uh, maybe you think that's that's not uh, something on the cards, but if you think about access to food, um, uh, I can certainly see that happening. And I can certainly see migration patterns happening simply due to climate change that then puts more pressure again on certain areas of the globe that are already disadvantaged, right? So if you think about places like Bangladesh, um, where there's a large number of people that will be just very likely be displaced in the not distant future. We're talking about 10 to 20 years simply because of sea level rise. Um, I used to live, again, I always come back to it. I used to live in Florida. I'm not going to make any more comments about Florida now. <laughs> I used to live in Florida. And uh, climate change in Florida is real. And the sea level rise in, in, in Florida is real. The sea level rise functions in different ways than we think normally. It starts off with not being able to flush the toilet in South Florida. Because the water pressures that are coming at various times will mean there's a there's a higher uh, groundwater level and then at some point means you can't flush it towards it, right? So it's it's weird, right? It's strange. Now you multiply that across and then you, you get to where where I'm going with. That's all to say there's a new kid in town. Right? And the new kid in town are scientists, entrepreneurs that work in the cellular agriculture space. Now I'm not a big Fan, and some people have asked me this or ask me all the time, are you a proponent of this? And I said, no, I'm actually not anything. I'm just looking at this relatively disinterestedly. Um, that might be belied by the fact that I was just recently appointed to a working group of Cellular Agriculture Australia on the regulatory side, but I'm actually just interested in how these people discuss things, right? And I'm the only lawyer in that whole space, which is fantastic for me because they actually come to me. Um, uh, not for advice, but just to think about how the regulatory aspect of this new kid on the block will look like, right? So if you indulge me for a second, I wanted to say what some cultivated food, not necessarily cell, um, um, precision fermented, fermented food, focusing on cultivated foods. What they're not is plant-based meats. So if most of you will have heard about plant-based meats. I, I think it's a terrible name. I never understand why, um, I used to be a vegetarian for a very long time, why there were sausages or why there are burgers. I mean, I get it from a marketing point of view, but apart from that, there's no reason to emulate the stuff that, that is you, you relate to meat, right? 
Um, you could package it completely differently, but you want to make, and I get it from a marketing point of view, you want to grab the people that like their burgers and they like their sausages in German, um, um, and you want to make it, but then you look at certain pictures during COVID. I don't know whether you've seen this, but you look at certain pictures during COVID, the one place that was the last one that was emptied out were the plant-based meats <laughs> because no one wanted them, right? <laughs> and they're not particularly good. I try pretty much everything just to know what I'm talking about, right? And some of them are absolutely terrible, right? But anyway, uh, so they're also not necessarily, and I say this in, with, with that proviso, not necessarily genetically modified organism-based. They could be, but they don't have to, right? So let's get around that. Now, what are, what are they actually? They're genuine animal meats. So Meredith, as you said, you do harm an animal to a certain degree because you're taking cells out of an animal. Look, if you're on the hard side of animal protection, you will find that it's sickable and that's fine. I will leave you on that side and I'm not gonna argue with you over that. But if you think about it in terms of the, in, sort of the invasive element, it's much less invasive than killing an animal, right? I think we can agree on that. The animal lives happily ever after. Well, not ever after, until it dies, right? Um, like we all do, right? But so that's um, the short version. So if you can see that on the, on the, on, oh, sorry, I haven't actually put that on there. there. The short version is this. And I'm happy to share the slides with you if you want later on. Um, but basically what you do is you take the, the, the cell out of the animal, um, you extract a uh, certain the stem cell, you, you, at the moment you still use an animal uh, nutrient medium, which is, of, which is oftentimes bovine fetal serum um, that actually harms animals, but that will very likely be produced or either artificially or plant-based in the near future, right? So you're taking that off the table. Sophia is looking at all of this and is like completely aghast. Actually, I'm not sure whether I'm reading your your facial expression correctly, but I'm like, God, <laughs> um, it's a brave new world that we're all living in the not very distant future, right? Then you put that growth medium on top of the cells. Eventually, and I'm not going to go into all the details. There's a lattice element involved where that latch has to latch onto, and like your bones, right? And then the, the muscle grows eventually, um, and what you get are muscle fibers. Now. Don't think like you get a muscle, like a steak type thing out of that at the moment. What you're getting mostly, mostly uh, is, um, is uh, sort of burger type or chicken nugget type things, all right? Because there, you have to still put it together and, and reconstitute it somehow. And you're all looking at it, oh my God, this is so awful. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't, but um, you might've heard about the mammoth burger that was released not long ago. Like, so they, the woolly mammoth, there's some DNA. So some, some of these people were, the mammoth burger, by the way, did not contain a whole lot of mammoth, all right? It was mostly, I think, all right? Cultivated, but not actual mammoth. The company that did it is an Australian company that really wanted to push the agenda and wanted to get that on the map. There's lots of people in the community that said that was a terrible idea to do uh, because it turned people off, right? And I can see this in your face. At the moment, I'm not selling it well. I'm not. I'm not in the business of selling it. Um, right? <laughs> it's so, your job. <laughs> but that's not my job, right? Like, like there's a market. There's, there, there's marketing departments out there for that. Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm an to. academic. Oh thanks, you're not trusting me. I could do it, right? No. No, she knows me. <laughs> she knows me way too well. So if you look over here, and and uh, Tracy, you can just look. Over here. Um, you ask me what what are the forms of cultivated foods that, that might exist? So you're talking about meat. Fish, seafood, fats, that's actually really important. You can create fats out of, out of this. Uh, you can create eggs, not in the actual egg, but if you look at uh, sort of scramble type eggs that you can already sort of substitute, which you can already buy in the supermarkets already, that you can easily buy. Talk to a, a, a German startup um, that they claim they can produce milk that is exactly the same molecularly as milk. All right, so that answers your question. And they're already in talks with the distributors of dairy products. So that section of the economy already knows that's coming. 
cheese manufacturers already know it's coming. The ones that are really against this, and I'll come to that later on, are the farmers. And that has political ramifications, that has economic ramifications, supply chains are going to be completely disrupted, all of the above, which is why I find this so fascinating. So you're running the gamut of talking to people from the scientists who are like the Franken labs, uh, all the way to politicians who might be out of their jobs or might not get elected, because in a place like Australia, where I, where I live, you have certain swaths of the territory that are that have traditionally voted for parties that are in favor of agriculture. Whether they're actually in favor of agriculture, I'll, I'll leave aside. But if you even think about 20 or 30 percent of the meat production being done by this method, some of this will, some of these areas will be depopulated then you no longer have the national party in Australia being elected to parliament. They should shake in their boots from my perspective. Right? So let me, let me try to, uh, to, to sort of move on very quickly. Um, there's reasons why some people, and I'll go only to the last bit, I'll, I'll focus down here. Um, Mariela, who was supposed to be here, uh, works with me on a different project related to all of this. She at one point wrote, um, it's better for the world, environmental impact. All question marks behind it, by the way. Um, again, I'm not selling it. Um, feeding the world, as in food security, and that they were getting to food security versus food safety. Um, and eat meat, not animals. All right, so this is the animal welfare project. And when you talk to people, they're working either in combination or on one or more of these projects, right, and trying to push uh, those narratives. Um, if, you, if you then look at um, Economic impacts, cultural impacts, political impacts. I've started to mention the political impact already. Shifts in employment. I would actually say everything that is con uh, is connected to meat production, starting from the person who, who runs around different farms and does the insemination of cows or any other animal, because none of these things are naturally done at this point, right? All the way to the cowboy, quote unquote, all then to the to the truck driver that drives that truck to the abattoir, to the people who work in abattoirs, which is a horrible job and it's not very hygienic, all the way to driving that meat then ultimately to the distribution centers and supermarkets where we end up buying. Those might all get to um, Culturally, I think, and this is important, I'll just flag it, there are narratives around agriculture in various countries that are very different. Uh, here in Colombia, there's a very strong narrative around Agricultura, same I would assume in Mexico, uh, Mexico, and lots of other countries. Certainly Australia, I would think New Zealand, the lambs, right? Like whether that narrative is true or not is irrelevant, but it's politically a powerful constituency. Right? Um, so politically, power shifts, I, I mentioned that already. Let me very quickly sort of come to the legal questions that come up, and they're both domestic and international. Um, some countries have actually moved on and have have uh, allowed the sale of cultivated food. That's Singapore. In Singapore, there's one butchery and one uh, a restaurant, from what I understand, where you can buy cultivated uh, meat. Let me ask you this, and I really mean this as sort of a yes no question. If you were going through Singapore and had a 12 hour layover, which was the plan for me to actually do, I would have actually gone. I, would, I want to know whether you would actually go and buy the cultivated chicken which you can get there and would eat it. Would anyone do that? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four. There's maybe. just so much other good food in Singapore. Why would I? Because it's the only it's the only it's the only country <laughs> where you can get it, right? No. <laughs> so then you have thing, you have the US, which is starting to move towards that, and that goes through the very normal regulatory channels that you can imagine, right? FDA, lots of other three-letter uh, acronyms involved. Um, uh, you have the EU, which will likely run through this with a novel food uh, uh, directive, right? Which basically means probably not. Um, you have Israel, and it's not a surprise that Singapore, to my mind, is the first uh, country to, to do this. If you don't have space to grow outward, you've got to grow in some sense upward. If you want food security, right? Um, uh, and you don't have a politically powerful constituency as farmers who will object, right? So there's various reasons for that. 
uh, anyone that had food security as such, right? Which, which if I'm Singapore and I'm looking around me, might be a real issue at one point. So you might be the first uh, off the block. Now, if you look at cultured or cultivated foods in the WTO, I'm thinking about not so much the gap, but I'm just flagging it. There's some, there might be some gap issues. There's certainly SPS issues. Um, there's TBT issues with respect to labeling. Um, uh, there might, be, there are trips agreement uh, questions that come up with respect to intellectual property rights. Um, and my concluding thoughts are: there's uncertainty about the timeline, the extent of the change in accessibility, but the regulatory environments, both internationally, I've not even talked very much about that uh, yet. Get to that. Uh, both domestically and internationally lead, need to react to this, right? And law is usually a laggard. And my own take with respect to this and lots and other areas I worked in, like autonomous weapon systems, completely unrelated to this, is lawyers need to get into that conversation much, much earlier at the front end rather than at the back end. Because at the back end, all we can say is yes or no. And we don't want to be the no people all the time. So be a constructive lawyer, get in on the front, which is why I'm giving you. Thanks. We don't, don't have, you have one? We don't have a presentation. So good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to say that uh, this project would not have been possible without uh, Marcus. And uh, the, the, other Mar <laughs> the, the other Marcus who committed the crime in Florida. <laughs> but this, this Marcus. And Ashutosh and I are very thankful to him for his time and invaluable inputs. So the topic of our article is a clash of paradigms, sustainable food systems, and international trade law. So, uh, food security, or we could say food insecurity, has taken the center stage globally due to a variety of reasons, such as changing weather patterns, uh, regional conflicts, such as the Russia-Ukraine war, and then uh, a rising tide of national policies. And sustainable agriculture and the role of trade in promoting uh, global food security is being discussed at various international forums from the UN to the G20. And uh, the concept of sustainable food systems or SFS, as we would say, uh, this, uh, this concept has not been addressed under the WTO law. However, very recently, uh, last uh, in June last year at the 12th Ministerial Conference of the WTO, the sustainability of food systems for the very first time formed part of, of the substantial discussions at the WTO, wherein the members, among other important outcomes for the purposes of food security, the members adopted an SPS declaration with the objective to identify challenges uh, related to international trade in animal, plant, and food. Now, the global food crisis was one of the major issues which was being dis discussed during the MC12. And while, while the concept of SFS is not something new and it has been discussed for a very long time, since the 1990s, both in academia and in international and domestic uh, policies. However, the for the first time, we are seeing that SFS is being discussed at the WTO. Uh, uh, in view of the SPS declaration. And our, our paper uh, essentially explores the directions the discussion on SFS might take both at the WTO and at the uh, preferential trade agreements level. So if, if you talk about the concept of SFS, over the years, several definitions have been developed from the uh, a widely used definition is of the Food and Agricultural Organization, that is the FAO. And all of, the, however, there's, there isn't a universally recognized definition that is unequivocally endorsed by all stakeholders. So there's still ambiguity about what a sustainable food system means. Each country might have a different interpretation of the term. And however, the common thread is most of these no, uh, definitions incorporate the notion that a sustainable food systems need to generate positive value along three dimensions simultaneously. And these three dimensions are environmental dimension, the social dimension, and the economic dimension. Uh, and in order to achieve uh, the ideal of uh, sustainable food systems, all the three dimensions of sustainability should be addressed. In our paper, we address the linkage between uh, sustainable food systems and WTO law, particularly in the context of the SPS agreement in view of the uh, MC12 declaration. Now, uh, the, um, the SPS declaration is a multilaterally endorsed work plan. And what the declaration does is uh, establish a work program and identifies certain themes which would constitute the mandate of the SPS committee. And one of these themes is how to facilitate global food security and more sustainable food systems. Now, the use of sustainable food systems by a ministerial conference of the WTO 
appears to herald a turn towards promoting SFS within the context of the WTO uh, here in the SPS agreement and potentially beyond. The primary issue with discussing sustainable food systems within the context of the SPS agreement flows from the very uh, aim of the SPS agreement, which is to promote food safety. Rather, the concept of SFS is more towards promoting global food security. So at the very outset, there is a conflict between the primary goal of the SPS agreement and the concept of SFS. The, uh, therefore, uh, discussing SFS within the AGs of the SPS committee would essentially mean expanding the existing scope of the SPS agreement so as to include measures related to sustainability of food systems, which is not what the SPS agreement is about. Now, in the context, context of SPS measures, it, it becomes very critical to distinguish uh, such SPS measures that are born out of genuine concern for the health and life of human, plant, and animals uh, on, one, on, on one hand, and on the other hand, from measures which are uh, protectionist in nature and might lead to trade barriers for several countries. Now, if you move on to the intricacies of uh, what this theme uh, under the SPS declaration means, now, there are three parts to the theme. First is a facilitation of food security and sustainable food systems. The second part is this is to be achieved through innovation in agricultural production and international trade. And the third part is through international standards, guides, and recommendations set by the international organizations. And there are issues with all of these parts. Uh, the, uh, the issue with the first part, which, which talks about uh, innovation in agricultural production is, is with access to innovation. And uh, technology and innovation forms a very critical part of sustainable production practices. And farmers in uh, developing countries and L LDCs, they're small scale and medium scale farmers, which do not have the required resources, the technology, the know-how, and the uh, resources which are required to enable sustainable production practices. And if in, in, in the absence of the required resources, the, these farmers would eventually lose out on the production, uh, sustainable production practices. So uh, we have a major issue with access to innovation. And then the second issue is with the adoption of new international standards on sustainability. At the moment, uh, the for formulation of international standards on sustainability is at the very exploratory stages. However, the organic food product trade is an area where issues are likely to arise in the near future. Theoretically, uh, if we say under the objective of promoting SFS, a country uh, requires that only organic food products are imported into the, that territory, then in, in such case, all the uh, trade in agricultural products into that particular country will get affected. And this is particularly going to hamper the interest of develop, developing countries and LDCs as these countries are already struggling with the adoption and the implementation of international standards. And on top of that, if there are new standards related to sustainability, these countries would find to comply with such standards quite challenging. Uh, going forward in our paper, we also address the tension between uh, SFS and preferential trade agreements. Now, uh, the EU has been exploring preferential trade agreements as a trade policy tool uh, to push for sustainable food systems. And in several of its new generation PTAs, EU has introduced a separate standalone chapter on sustainable food systems in addition to the chapters on trade and sustainable development and the SPS chapter. Now, my, my co-author Ashutosh will be discussing the entry of SFS in the PTAs and how uh, the obligations under EU's PTAs are. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, uh, as you heard, sustainable food system, while a long debated issue, is a new area to be negotiated as part of preferential trade agreements. Now, I will focus on tracing the sustainable food system related obligations in trade agreements, core obligations which are featuring into these uh, sustainable food related obligations, nature of these obligations, and potential implication. Now, uh, the, this, this is very recent development. The one agreement that I could trace was uh, Japan-Australia 2015 Economic Partnership Agreement, wherein there is a chapter on food supply. It doesn't cover uh, sustainability entirely, sustainable sustainability of food system entirely, but it deals with the supply aspect. And this only uh, deals with certain food items, which they have called essential food items, which includes meat, milk, cream, cheese. You can see all items covering protein requirements. Then 
then there are new eu's new generation uh, new generational preferential trade agreements and there are four agreements particularly which contains a dedicated chapter to sustainable food system these are new zealand uh, eu's agreement with new zealand and eu's proposal to chile indonesia and india which is still in the ongoing negotiation stage now uh, the reason for eu to propose a dedicated chapter on sustainable food system is not very clear at this stage however there are two doc two official documents which points towards change in domestic policy there is one joint statement of the eu's council commission and parliament which talks about proactive engagement at the multilateral level concerning the application of eu's health and environmental st standards to the imported agricultural product and second is the report of the eu commission to the eu parliament and council which recognizes which recognizes that food system is responsible for a significant portion of greenhouse gas emissions and further it also underlines eu's ambition to become a global leader in food sustainability by promoting sustainable food system at international level through its trade, trade agreement so probably this is one of the reason why we are say, seeing a lot of dedicated sustainable food system chapter in eu eu agreement now now coming to uh, what are these core obligations and i would like to highlight in the beginning that uh, this eu uh, the eu proposal to indonesia india and chile is probably the most ambitious text that they have proposed and the one agreed with new zealand ha has a lot of obligations which are differing in nature and has different impact levels so in terms of core provision and obligations the chapter on sustainable food system have provisions concerning obligations and declaratory provisions concerning cooperation to improve the sustainability fight against food fraud food loss and waste reduction in use of chemical at the production stage animal welfare standards cooperation in multiple uh, multilateral forum etc now some of these issues such as plant health and animal welfare standards are already dealt under sps agreement and interestingly this this uh, proposed sfs chapter applies in addition to the existing obligations under sps tbt and a dedicated chapter on sustainability now uh, the applicability of dispute settlement dispute settlement is not clear at this stage especially with regard to the eu's proposal to indonesia chile and india and most probably dispute settlement will not be applicable however there is one provision which uh, which is which raises concern so uh, eu's proposal to these three developing country has a sub, has proposed a sub committee under sps committee which is uh, which is supposed to oversee the action plan and implement implementation of the obligations undertaken under these chapters which has the potential to turn these uh, this seemingly cooperation provisions into hard obligations going forward now uh, so uh, this is all with regard to eu's proposal uh, i would prefer to answer later uh, in form of questions now to borrow the words of professor veera from the first round table she says standard uh, setting standard is new colonialism and as we have presented that setting uh, this sustainable food system requirements may lead to setting of new standards so this is a new area which developing country needs to navigate very carefully and uh, in conclusion again i would like to borrow the word of marcus that as a trade lawyers probably we should not say no very often and maybe we'll have to find a way to accommodate sustainability into our agreements and there are some traces if you see uh, the agreement establishing wto and agreement on agriculture the preamble mentions some of the aspects such as they talk about raising the standards of living with, with keeping sustainability in mind food security so i think uh, there may be a need to accommodate this into trade discussion or trade agreement discussion whether sps is a answer or not that remains to be seen and further this bring back, this brings back the old question asked by jagdish bhagwati whether uh, preferential trade agreement or regional trade agreement will work as a stepping stone or stumbling block in this particular area thank you very much thank you well that's three fascinating um, presentations and i'm sure there's lots of questions um i'm just going to get started perhaps with one question to each panelist and um, we've got about 40 minutes so i think there's lots of time for questions from the panelists to each other and from the audience as well um like, well i just wondered and i know you didn't talk about this particular issue but um i've been reading as well about mexico's recent ban on genetically modified um, cool. products and i'm not quite sure where that's at in terms of um you know dispute with the us but i wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about about that ban and the reasons for it and sort of where that's at with the United States? 
Yes, of course. Uh, the ban is uh, uh, it's also in the decree of the president. It comes from the direct executive uh, direct executive executive uh, decision. No, so the ban is uh, on all GMOs for human consumption, and the basis is of course uh, human health and safety. And I would add, you know, what was missing in the in panel twenty three is, is food security, food safety, and there's another S. No which we haven't heard about a lot, food sovereignty. No? Okay. And the Mexican Ministry of Agriculture's position, because it has a vice uh, minister who comes from civil society, is, foods, uh, is defending food sovereignty in FAO, and is one of the leading uh, voices in food sovereignty in the FAO. So this has changed a lot from, from other administrations. So to tell you what's happening basically is, the president by decree and he i mean this is not uncommon of my president he talks every day every single day for hours no a tv program no <laughs> no no he's, 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 he's no no chavez is uh, chavez was uh, more uh, he had longer programs but it was only once a week this is every wow. day no so uh, uh the thing is that the president Lopez Obrador said Basically, I'm making this decree in order to protect human health of Mexican persons. And then, this is when may, I can see his, the Minister of Agriculture and the Minister of Commerce say, going back to this, and to protect Mexican industry and buy, to buy our own corn. So, I mean, this is a problem with the measure. No, it's clearly also a protection of the market. I mean, but still, this is an ongoing, uh, an ongoing conflict with the US because if you know the history of NAFTA, there's been quite parallel agreements regarding corn, regarding sugar, of course, and it's always a, a, a big piece of negotiation. The last week, I think the director, or I don't know what's the formal title of the Association of uh, Corn Producing, uh, or the, the exact acronym of in association in Illinois said, this is a big problem. We have GMO uh, seeds planted now in Illinois, and it takes a year to, to send to Mexico. It's, I don't know what percentage of their, of their uh, production goes to Mexico. So basically what's gonna maybe happen, in my opinion, is there's gonna be a bilateral negotiation in which there's gonna be a further period in which there would be some accommodation for uh, these uh, this farmers, no? And afterwards there's gonna be an implementation of the ban periodically, I think so. No? Or maybe the process is complete ban. And but the, with there's a difference between white corn and, and uh, uh, yellow corn. Yellow corn in Mexico is mostly used for animal feed because it's not the staple that's used in all the production of tortillas and tamales and 90% of Mexican cuisine. So uh, and and white corn is used for that. So the first ban was on white on um, yellow corn. And then this is something I want to point out. We should think about processes now and uh, and. and the, value chains now also. Maybe we are too focused on the products and not on the, on the production uh, on, the, on the production scale. So I think there's going to be a quite different legal battle with white corn. So is, it, is there a genuine health concern at some level uh, in Mexico it, or is that just a problem? Well, I have to make a disclaimer. I come from a, uh, from um, CIDE, CIDE depends on CONACYT. The director of CONACYT is Marilena Alvarez Buya, who's the one who made the report for the presidency saying GMO modified corn is a health hazard. So she may, and she hates us, so she may fire me if I say otherwise. No, but the thing is, it's very disputed. It it's goes both ways. Yeah. Scientifically, you can find, well, if you ask Carhill, it's completely non, uh, there's no, affect, no effect, uh, affectation for health, no, whatever. It's very, in, you know, the scientific details are very good. Yeah. Um, just while we're talking about safety, Marcus, this is these cultivated foods. Um, at this point, do we know if there are safety issues or is it just kind of a moral, you know, people getting used to it kind of idea? Or is there? Look, there are safety sense? issues like in every other food production chain that you can imagine, mm -hmm. right? Um, the safety. I mean, let me, all right, let me start there. If you look at how we 
and there's a there's there's stuff in cellular agriculture that I'm not that I said I wouldn't go into, but sometimes you have to basically nuke certain facilities because there's bacteria growing that shouldn't be growing, and because it's bacteria growth that actually um, produces the, the the end result, you can't have cross contamination of that, right? So that nuking actually is really really expensive uh, because you have to literally clean everything because we're talking about right? level. Nice. Um, so that's that. Um, now, if you think about, and most of us don't, right? If you think about the production of animal products, it's about the non prettiest way of producing food. And I'm not saying this is a former uh, vegetarian, I eat meat by now, but if you think about the sanitary implications of food production, they're actually pretty horrible, right? Like everything having to do with the killing of the animals, having to do with, with even the transport of the animals, the killing of the animals, the exposure of uh, workers in this process, the exposure of fecal matter, I'm sorry to be that blunt, but uh, with whatever we eat, it's not sanitary, right? So I'm not saying this to defend, all I'm saying is we need to put this in relation to, to I think that's sort of intellectually honest, we need to put this into relation to what the alternative might be. Can I imagine that certain things go wrong in this production process? Yes. Because there's no large scale production at this point, you can't really point to it and it's all relatively under wraps. Um, but can I imagine that? Yes. Can I imagine that that can be clean, cleaned up and that you need to have strong supervisory functions? Uh, I, and here I speak more from a, I think European perspective where I would say the government has a role to play i.e. one of supervisory roles that we sort of see in the current process, but oftentimes in large agricultural markets are sort of industry internal supervision, right? Where you say, well, I am certifying that company X is or by the way, that's also paying me, um, um, uh, is complying with all the uh, development standards, right? Um, now, there are always going to be detractors uh, that are raising issues, right? So there have been some reports that some of this may be detrimental for reasons that are unclear to me at least. And when I speak to my colleagues in the sciences, they're also like, don't quite know why those concerns are raised, but that's not unusual. And that was the same thing with, I think when the car was invented, right? When the car was invented, people were afraid that their organs would get squashed because they're now traveling at higher speeds, right? It's like, it's like weird stuff. All right, or when the train, I think it might have been caught, it might have been the trains. Um, but because we're traveling at speeds higher than what a horse could do, right? And so therefore all of a sudden it's like, well, oh, it seems strange, bizarre, but so could I imagine certain things? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can I imagine this is I think the real problem, that whole batches of food that were produced in the same uh factory, if you will, because it will be a factory, it won't be a laboratory in the same sense anymore. Mm -hmm. But that again is no different from an abattoir where there are certain unsanitary uh, practices, right? And, and if you know anything about food production, say in the US and chicken, um, chlorine is all over the place for a reason, right? For a reason. So are there? Yes. Um, would I want to minimize them? No. But do I think in relation they can be handled? Probably yes. So I guess just one more question maybe for the two of you and then we'll turn to um, Shashka. Um, so the case of Mexico's ban on GMOs, which there are some, there see some health concerns, but you have these food sovereignty concerns and other issues as well. And the potential issues that are gonna be raised with cultivated foods or cellular agriculture. They do, both these cases seem to really encapsulate potential conflict between food safety and food security mm -hmm. because both GMOs <laughs> and this new kind of agriculture obviously have a lot of potential to feed the world. Um, so do you think, like, I guess, what are the possible pathways to sort of defining some kind of balance between these goals when they come into conflict? Like, is the SPS agreement up to the task where we have to go through this exercise of defending our measures based on science? Or do you think we actually need something else? It's a good question. But I, I was thinking if we don't, if these problems are not old wine in new bottles, because I mean, it's uh, hormones, big hormones, yeah. it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Green Revolution, GMOs. Uh, uh, I, I, I think, I mean, I even think that I will speak basically as a, I don't know, interpreting the Mexican foreign policy, the trade policy uh, position. 
maybe uh, I think the Mexican, at least the, the, the foreign the, the trade ministry knows that it cannot ban all GMO uh, corn because it needs GMO corn for mm -hmm. the demand to uh, and this is what's, what basically many of the associations of, of agricultural producers are telling the, the government. No? But still, I think it's a very strong point in order to not only protect the, the local industry, but also culturally. That's why I, I did the anthropological term, because the problem with uh, trade is that it's always being uh, completely dislocated from cultural, uh, cultural ideas. And corn in Mexico is a basic make the cultural matrix as it's all in all Latin America no? as you've seen here if you had breakfast you had an arepas that's quite basic and um, basically I think that maybe you could work it out to many ways I mean first negotiations I would think that this is just a confrontation and it's in on that and also you we all know the efficiency of, of uh, uh, WTO panels and how much negotiation goes on and everything. But second of all, I think that maybe some escape clauses would be not only health, but also culture may be a rising uh, issue that maybe it's not that uh, compatible in this sense, but maybe can be brought into negotiations into a broader, broader agreements. No? Also, the in Osmeca, at least yesterday or no? Last week in Cancun, in the final declaration, there was nothing said about corn. I mean, we're all happy. We, we have, we must embrace stronger trade ties, especially in these difficult times in which we need uh, short supply chains and everything. That's that's a message, you know. And nothing was said about corn. Labor is an issue now. So who knows what's going to happen? There's consultations going, and I think one bad uh, bad news for Mexico is that Canada wanted to participate in the consultations. So we may have a trade dispute. I think this, this may be coming, but I don't know if that the trade dispute is just one area of a broader negotiation. Issues and these issues like culture, human health. Also, the World Food Summit was two years ago. I mean, and Mexico was uh, participating very, uh, in India also in China, no, I have a very different position. The World Food Summit. And, the UN Special Rapporteur for food uh, for the right to food is now uh, talking a lot about food systems and global food systems and global trade. In food. So I think there are much more complicated elements that can be brought into negotiation. Thank you. Okay. So let me just sort of think about whether the SPS agreement is up to the task, right? And and I sort of wish I was sitting on the other side now with my I can't help to use that term. Partners in crime, haha. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, but I think the fun, so there I would say something about that there's a fundamental clash that we shock at already out between the food safety and the food security. Because frankly, the SPS agreement, at least my interpretation, and, and you might disagree, right, uh, Tracy? But I don't think, right? So both, both Tracy and I have written about the SPS agreement for, for I don't know, decades now, right, in some sense. Um, the way I think about the SPS agreement comes out of a very particular mindset of when science had sort of definitive, almost like definitive answer, right? Where it was like, there's one right answer to it. And that was never true, right? Um, there's lots of people who, who write on sort of the philosophy of science that have shown that to a great extent, right? Kuhn and other people are out there and it's well known. But in the WTO, we never, made, we never actually understood that thing. All right, uh, or in the trade world, we never understood that part. We in the US is, I think, the main culprit on this one, believes that there is one objective sort of way of thinking about scientific evidence. And if it isn't positive evidence, then it just goes out by the window. All right, so you look at, for example, the SPS agreement and compare that to what ended up in the CPTPP, uh, SPS chapter, and I happen to have written about that, uh, and just compare the two. It's a completely different leitmotif uh, on what sort of the idea of science is there, right? So that's sort of a slight precursor statement. So the question of, is the SPS up, agreement up to the task with respect to cultivated foods, right? I would think that's like the answer to that is almost yes, because cultivated foods in that sense are no different from any other type of food. The bigger problem with the SPS agreement is over there with sustainable food systems, right? 
Because at least from what I read, and I'm looking at sort of the, the cultivated food cell act more generally, I don't think that the science is going to, like the, 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 the safety issues are the big stumbling block. The big stumbling blocks is your reaction at this point. When I asked you, would you buy it, right? Mm -hmm. Or your reaction when I said certain things. Again, I'm not in the in, in, I'm not trying to sell this. I'm just trying to sort of expose people to. In about ten years, my prediction is we will all have the opportunity to buy cultivated foods. Will that have to be labeled? Will, if it's molecularly the same, right? And I, I, I've given a version of this talk before. Uh, where both Vishaka and Ashutosh were present, right? And you might recall, I forget, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gandhi, huh. who was like, this is completely different. And I was like, no, it's molecularly actually the exact same thing, right? Like, and he sort of resisted. I was like, no, no, it's actually not. Like, you can't make the argument it's so different because molecularly it's the same. Isn't there a production process and production method? No. There? Well, there is a process and production method, but we 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 have so far. And I'm a big fan of saying production for the uh, process of production methods should matter with respect mm -hmm. to certain, say, climate. climate change. But in this particular instance, I don't actually see what the difference is, right? So, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to switch my position on, on this, but I don't see the problem on the product, process and production method, right? Well, can we even say that uh, this cultivated food is more sustainable in the sense that we're not pu pushing, uh, putting pressure on the limited resources that we have and then we're producing more food? That's okay. That's one of the narratives that I try to sort of say, and, and that Mariela would, uh, would say. Um, it, the jury on that, and, it, and I think it's important to point that out. I think the answer is yes, but the jury is out because we actually don't know. If you look at it, it most often, frankly, depends on how you produce energy. Because if you, I mean, I might just go, I, I can't go back to the slide easy, so we won't do that. No, no, no don't, don't worry about it. But if you remember that slide with with uh, you take the, the the cell out and so forth, eventually it goes into what I would call a big vat, right? And so those are tend to be sort of aluminum tanks that you know from beer brewing. They're about that size, right? What we're mimicking here is it's a bioreactor mimic being mimicked, right? I.e., the human or animal. Uh, a female body is being mimicked somehow, which means you need to heat that place up. So there's a fair amount of energy consumption that goes into it. Now, from my perspective, if you have wind turbines and, and solar and, and renewable energies more broadly in this, then that bit goes out the window. Now there's other things, right? And people are working on this. Economists are actually really doing good work in this space. Uh, needless to say, people at the university, at certain universities in the US, which happen to be major cattle producing states, tend to be very, very, um, um, shall we say skeptical about these things? And I can't help to think that, that there might be a connection to that. But um, I think it's important to look at the, those life cycle uh, assessments. I don't think that the SPS agreement is in that sense, the big issue, all right? Um, yeah, let me maybe just leave it there. Because these things, have, these people have more important things. I'm very conscious of wanting to get to audience yeah. questions. So I'll just ask one quick question and then audience. Them jump in. Um, I guess just about this tension between sustainable food systems and international trade. Um, what do you think are the possible pathways towards resolving the tension? Is it multilateral solutions or bilateral agreements? <laughs> What's your thing? I should um, be so thank you for the question. I think, <laughs> yeah. question. <laughs> so, uh, I think as we've seen from the presentation, yeah. that there is a clear tension. So, with regard to the tension, we can be certain that there is a tension between sustainable food yeah. system and international trade. Uh, but then again, reborrowing Marcus's word that uh, as a trade lawyer, probably saying no is not enough. And as I as I uh, quoted uh, the preamble wording from Marcus agreement and agreement on agriculture. So there are some uh, we can't say that it can be excluded entirely from trade agreement or from the scope of WTO. Uh, multilateral, I would say that a multilateral solution is desirable because uh, uh, because it will have multiple voices. It will have voices of almost all the country who are WTO member. Uh, there can be an argument that bilateral agreements can also be a solution. So it leads to consensus building subsequently. But uh, I would leave with this that the multilateral solution is desirable. Probably plurilateral may not be enough. Can I jump in there? And just sure. as you were talking, so look, we'll, we'll nail the colors to the mask. 
this piece over there is co-written between the three of us, right? Um, the, as you were just speaking, I was just thinking, the answer is actually no. There is such a clash there that at some point, the WTO members will have to figure out which one is more important to them. Food safety, which we should not discard entirely, or the sustainability and food security element, right? But it, that at some point will come to a head from my perspective, right? Uh, sorry to jump in there. Yeah, and even if I recollect from the discussions which have been happening under the SPS committee on this issue, a lot of countries are against discussing SFS within the context of SPS. It is primarily the EU which, which we can say wants to push its own domestic policy and uh, it's already doing it in its FTAs and it also wants it to discuss at the multilateral level. Uh, because uh, the term uh, SFS is used only by the EU. Um, other major countries, for example, the US, it, uh, it uses the term sustainable agriculture, not sustainable food system. Because sustainable agriculture is something which flows from the S SDGs. SDGs talk about sustainable production, sustainable consumption, sustainable agricultural practices. So that is fine. But then specific reference to sustainable food systems in the context of the SPS agreement is uh, something which is problematic. Can I? Uh, yeah, one question no, from Mikhail and then audience. No, no, no question, <laughs> just a yeah, remark. Back, but there's also a fourth world perspective. I mean, there's agroecology. You know, those many indigenous uh, people are talking about agroecology in other ways. So, mm -hmm. And some governments are taking that, uh, that idea into uh, trade negotiations and mm -hmm. rather, or trade restrictions. Other other areas. Uh, uh, now, do we need a um, question? <laughs> do we do we need the microphone to be passed no, around? No, 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 okay. No yeah. no okay, perfect. All right. Um, sorry. Where should we start? We'll start here. Right. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, this is definitely a new area for me, and the, the reason I got I'm interested <laughs> in this topic of walking because I have an environmental. Um, scientists at home who is working about biodiversity and why it is very important to food security because then uh, when you're soil and uh, you don't have biodiversity to you could have a stranded uh, um, your uh, survivability of like certain plants uh, are going are going to go extinct and so how do we uh, like just follow up what you said and how do we marry the two you're, you're trying to distinguish them, but I feel like they're, I mean, based on, I'm not a scientist or nor as an expert in this uh, this topic, right? So how do you marry the two and how do you, and also on that, like, on that topic, uh, many scientists are, are arguing that to ensure the sustainable agriculture is to have localized regional um, like food supply chains. And that leads to geo, like, fragmentation of food Supply chains uh, and um, and our supply chains. So, what what are your thoughts on that? And how does <laughs> I yield play to that? So, actually, I would say there's a marriage between three because uh, due to posture of time, I didn't go into the details of the different dimensions of sustainable food systems. But as I mentioned, there are three dimensions: the economic, social, and the environmental dimension. And the environmental dimensions takes into account the biodiversity part. It the key elements are. Uh, land uh, land use and then use of uh, chemicals, toxicity levels, and, and uh, the biodiversity. So uh, when we talk about SFS, all of these elements have to be looked into and combined so as to achieve the objective of uh, SFS. And that's why it is very difficult to, you know, sort of uh, take care of all the factors. For example, the social dimension, it is very difficult to factor in or, or quantify the, what, what do you mean by the, uh, social dimension because it it it, it majorly focuses on uh, inclusion of the vulnerable groups which are characterized on the basis of gender race and then income groups and then there comes the economic dimensions which talk, talks about jobs tax revenues and enhancing the productivity as at large so this is uh, this is why the concept of sfs has been uh, has been in i would say there has been a clear tension between trade and SFS because it is very difficult to harmonize all the three elements together and take care of all the three dimensions simultaneously, which is the desirable way to achieve a sustainable food systems. But then at the same time, it is extremely uh, not practical to do such a thing. 
Um, okay. um, should we go up here then? <laughs> um, one question for Mark with respect to your comment that you have to choose between security and sustainable production. I understood correctly. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that because yeah, my understanding is that it goes very much together. Only if you produce sustainably, you will also secure future production. Uh, so my culture, culture. So the clash that I said was food safety versus food security. Oh, right. So just to be clear, it's food safety versus food security. Now, I think the, the reason why I'm saying there's a clash there is, and I think the SPS, the SPS agreement isn't the right place to deal with sustainable food systems, but it's the place that we traditionally have dealt with it because that's where agriculture happens, in the WTO, right? And in trade agreements more generally, not just in the, not blaming the WTO. But I think we're, it's a little bit like all the trade and debates we've had over the last, I don't know, um, since 1995, right? Um, I don't know, two or three years ago, I had this idea, we need to reimagine the WTO, right? And when Gabrielle Marceau made her comment earlier on, I sent her a, a message and said, when she said, we need to think about environmental lists, like environmental scientists, for example, um, being part of the WTO team, right? That, that rang, I'm like, oh, thank you. Finally, someone saying it. So I sent her a message and said, we should write an article about this. And she's like, yes, let's do it, right? You need to reimagine, because we've had these debates since 1995, right? So I remember Jos probably wrote about it, wrote his dissertation about it. Lots of people wrote about whether these external concerns should make their way into the WTO, trade external, right? And we've always traditionally said, nope. We shouldn't, but I think we can't expect, ignore the negative externalities that great trade potentially brings with it, right? Like, look, I'm, I'm talking to the, probably I'm preaching to the converted here in this space, right? But I think that's where, that's the space where that discussion started, right? And we need to then bring it much more into the actual trade policy realm. I completely agree, especially because this dualism, trade and the other structures, it's, yes. not, it's not actually, that's not what the word looks like. Yeah. Yeah. It's very much they're, that, yeah. they're mutually reinforcing or interdependent. Exactly. Another, right? Yeah. And I'm also very critical um, about viewing trade as a in and of itself, um, which I also think we actually need to um, also listen to our debate. Yeah. I also thought it was super interesting to bring the expertise in and see how, how what, what happens. Uh, in, yeah. um, I have a question to want to know. Um, I wonder how uh, mature these uh, technologies for, uh, for the farm. So, in other words, uh, will they uh, devise uh, technologies affordable? And um, I can give so, you that. That answer is short. And yes, <laughs> I, I don't know your answer. And then, uh, what is in your view? The biggest barrier to dissemination of this uh, of these technologies. Are we talking now about the second uh, GMO here? And uh, also, do you, uh, can you imagine that some countries need to be more uh, interested uh, to get these technologies uh, than others? All right. So the first answer, or the, the answer to your first question, is no. It's not affordable at this time. It's hugely expensive on a per on a per weight basis or per per volume basis, if you think about milk, right? Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we're talking about thousands of dollars essentially for each little morsel of food if you were to price it according to. But that's true for every new technology. If you look at the first electric cars, they were hugely expensive. No one could afford them, right? And now they're becoming much more mainstream. So there is a big question of whether you have to basically employ scientists in order to make these things happen, right? So it is a bit of a laboratory type thing. But on the other hand, we figured out how to do beer. I'm not saying it's the same thing, but but we, we are good at at some point moving from a stage of of heightened like hyper vigilance with respect to the production process to normalizing production processes anywhere else, right? Like like I can't think of a quick and easy example, but but uh, but but those things happen all the time. And human ingenuity is pretty great. What about that? 
So that's number one. Uh, number two uh, question, barrier. the biggest it's barrier. barrier. Um, I think there's several, unfortunately. All right, so I'm not trying to cop out, but I think the biggest one is the reaction of people in this room, the psychological one. I frankly don't understand that because once I told you or tried to run you through how terrible uh, husband, like like actual animal husbandry and 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 the abattoirs are, um, you might reconsider that. But there's an ick fact, what I would call the ick factor to to all of this, right? Um, and I think that will be overcome over time. There are other factors that I think are going to be playing out, and I think this goes to your last question, if I remember that correctly. Different places dealing differently with things. So um, I think there's two things that I would say to this. One is large, powerful agricultural lobbies will be putting up a fight because it simply goes towards the core of their business model. Not only business, but also agricultural under uh, sorry, cultural understandings, right? So um, like the narratives around in certain countries are much stronger. The narrative in, about in, in Singapore with respect to agriculture is virtually zero. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but they, that's my point. But it's virtually zero, right? Because, and that's why it's not surprising that, that Singapore moves ahead with it, right? Because there's literally no pushback. I would imagine, well, I don't have to imagine, Italy, for example, came out and says they do not want cultivated foods. There's a reason for it. Again, France. much more cultural. France is sort of, hasn't, I haven't heard anything from France, but I would imagine France would be uh, part of that, right? But Italy has very clearly said we don't want it, right? But it's not its call, right? If, it, if it's uh, consumers want it because it might go down in price and it will go down in price. So the, the, the person I was talking about before, the milk entrepreneur in the Bicoli Black Forest, right, where I grew up, Basically says no. Our 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 price point that we think we can achieve is actually below the price of traditionally produced milk, and they seem pretty level-headed about that. So that's so so the other one, and this is I think the tricky one. So so Mariela Chingfulin and I are writing a piece at the moment uh, about this. Is so the risk appetite that different countries have and the risk perception and risk frameworks are trying to apply that different countries have with respect to different sort of potential harms, right? And I always say, well, the US is always sort of saying we don't subscribe to the precautionary principle. My response to this is, have you ever been to a US airport? <laughs> I am, and I have, and I'm very glad I will not step into US airports Again, for the foreseeable future. Won't go into detail. <laughs> yeah. but, but you can see where, that, where I'm going with it, right? So different countries have different first percent. So let's leave, let me leave it there. She just told me to shut up. I can, um, I just, so we, we started 10 minutes late, so I figure we can go 10 minutes beyond. Um, so it gives us about seven more minutes. Um, so can we have a couple more questions? No, no, it's good, good. Meredith. I'm yeah. just looking what comes after this. Sorry, I'm, I'm uh, responding. Is that okay? I'm just yeah, assuming yeah, yeah. it's okay. There's a, a, there, there's a half hour break. Okay. Uh, and that will run late. Okay. So, first, a comment to Miguel and then a question. I'd like to say that um, when I started practicing, my law firm had represented Mexico in the NAFTA, and we did a lot of stuff on sugar, and I represented Mexico, Mexican agriculture. So, I feel Mexico's pain, but this does seem a little bit like we'll go into these levels to now uh, and GMO form, but anyway, we'll see how. Um, I guess my question is thinking about the, the S of, um, of uh, sustainability, about, about climate change. Well, climate change. I'm wondering whether food safety is going to um, invoke less in a protection, what I'll call a protectionist way, which is how I personally view the GMO issues with them. I mean, like you just said, with respect to the, uh, the, the uh, cultivated. Foods, if you don't want to eat it, don't eat it. Then why are you going to ban it, right? And, and it seems like the impact of having more animals, right, or the ability to perhaps have fewer animals by virtue of um, cultivating meat, the ability to use less fertilizer in these GM crops, those impacts, it seems to me, um, I guess my question is do you, do, you, do you agree or do you think that over time, as the climate emergency becomes even more clearly emergent, 
emergency that more and more countries are just going to say, look, I mean, we understand that we need everyone. We're going to need to not just do things the way we've been doing things. And that's just to feed people. But then there's the additional climate impact where we should have fewer animals. We should use less fertilizer. So I'm going to throw that, that question over to, 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 the, to you two because I've already spoken too much. I might tell you a little bit something. We can talk about this after. But I think. You want to add on? No. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you don't know this. They're married. Yeah. <laughs> so when, so when she's like, do you want to read no, that? No, that's not <laughs> uh, So to answer that question, uh, I, I would just say that uh, this is an accepted fact that uh, climate change is real and we need to move to we need to move towards more sustainable food systems uh, ideally but then the issue is uh, that a one size fits all approach is not going to help uh, as we have, we have also been seeing in the discussions which, which has been happening uh, in relation to the mc12 declaration countries have been seeing especially the developing countries like paraguay and uh, and mexico uh, these countries are uh, producers of tropical fruits and if, if, if we take the issue of MRL, the MRL issue, which is the maximum residue levels found in food products, uh, plant products. So these countries, due to their geography and the inherent climatic conditions, they are more prone to certain uh, issues, which the countries which, uh, which are more cooler and in the higher altitude, these countries are not. So if, if, if we talk about reconciling the differences, we, we have to be mindful of the inclusiveness that we, we cannot leave certain countries behind in pursuit of some uh, far far fetched goal such as a, a sustainable food system and globally sustainable production practices so my only point is that yes it is desi desirable that we move towards sustainability and sustainable food systems but at the same time we need to be mindful of the co consequences for all countries like developed developing and ndcs Uh, well, I wanted to comment on some of the oh, questions. Sure. Well, about biodiversity. Well, uh, just the thing is that the Biodiversity Convention is one of the only conventions that recognizes participation of uh, vulnerable groups or ethnic groups. No? So if you grab the, the Biodiversity Convention and you grab, for example, the recent UNDROP, the Declaration of the Rights of Peasants, and you, uh, in the Latin American context, the Inter-American Commission's uh, remarks on, on natural descendants and everything. If you combine that, you, know, you will have like many arguments in favor of, of, bio, of consultation of local communities and indigenous people and Afro uh, descendants for biodiversity issues in trade negotiations or trade or, or trade related areas, in agriculture and food. So I think maybe we're sometimes we're very close on international trade law and we don't open the door to some of the things that are just law oriented not even i'm not saying biology or anthropology or whatever no and uh, another comment is that i think that well um in a sense also there's about the trade and issue no one of the things is trade and human rights i mean how long are we gonna still as international lawyers sustain that there's this strong fragmentation and it is not politically biased. I mean, that's one of the complete, most rid ridiculous things we can uh, state. No? And but we st still teach people uh, and future lawyers that the international law is kind of a system and has rules. And then there's this complete fragmentation between international and economic law. So, so. Let me maybe just say one thing, right? And we, I don't think we're in disagreement, but I think the fear of the international economic lawyer mm -hmm. is that, and I think this is what Meredith might have been driving at as well, mm -hmm. is, is this sort of um, fear of protectionism being coming under the guise of, right? Yes, yes, and I think course. this is a perennial, I mean, this, look, this is a perennial question of, inter, of international trade law, right? Is this sort of where is the line between. But between economic running? sanctions, I mean, uh, uh, based on human rights. I mean, no, that, that's I, already happening. No, I, I get it. Right? <laughs> so just come to, but, but to come back to, to, to Meredith's point, uh, my own take is that 
we have moved, if you look at Pendulum Smith, right? We're moving towards a place where we are saying the ex negative externalities of trade or generally just negative outcomes. We're trying to avoid it because look around us. Uh, you don't have to even live in Australia anymore to realize that bushfires, as we would call them, or, or wildfires, as called in North America, are a thing. You have to, you, you go to Germany and they're a thing, right? Where that never happened, right? On a large scale, that's happening almost every summer now. And, and so I think we're recognizing that. And, and my own take is that the food safety element will be there. It needs to be there because if we don't have food safety, there's a we have a serious problem. We don't have to do the Australian slash New Zealand version of it, where I always say it might be a bit over the top uh, for, for different reasons that we'll go into. But reconciling the two is going to have to be the name of the game. I just don't know that the SPS agreement is capable, like we're not capable, I'm not saying I'm not blaming the SPS agreement, right? Hard to do that. There's no agency. But, <laughs> but, but I don't know that we have the capability to do it within the SPS agreement as it stands. And, and, and I think I'm, my own work has been try to push the boundaries of the SPS agreement in more, on more than one occasion. I just don't think that the SPS agreement is the right vehicle for it, right? The problem is it's then a stumbling block if you look at something else, right? Um, so I think where that is, we'll have to figure out on that paper, uh, more so than the cultivated foods. Okay, should we take one last question? Everyone's happy with that? Please. My question is, uh, what is the European Union offering in this country to present the <laughs> I guess it's the equivalent of trade freedom. Oh. <laughs> 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 that is a tricky question. Uh, I don't think, I think that uh, some of the countries don't have the option. It comes as a package. So uh, yes, that because, is the thing. Yes, to add to it, because as, uh, as far as I'm aware, the EU has a very strong policy that they won't uh, uh, go ahead with the FT or the preferential trade agreement if you don't agree to a sustainable food systems chapter. Yes. So what option do the countries have which want to enter into an agreement with the EU? So it's it, the EU has a very strong push towards promoting sustainable food systems given that it wants to be a leader in sustainability practices and can I add, can I follow up on that? Because I actually I don't know the answer to that. Right? We had a discussion over over breakfast this morning. Sorry. But but do you have a sense? And do you have a sense of whether the, the EU is doing this for protectionist? To my, the question to me is, is that being done for protectionist purposes? Because if it's not, then to my mind, then it's not as much of a trade issue rather than maybe a process issue. And that's what we talked about this morning, right? Um, of the take it or leave it approach and you being the hegemon and the bully that just says you take it or leave it, right? And I said this morning, I'm, I can't disagree with the policy of wanting that, but I disagree with the way that, with the process, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, often it's a template issue as well. Like there might be a particular partner where they want to push a particular agenda, yeah. but they need to have it everywhere yeah. because they need to say yes, to country yes. X, well, so you could even do it. I was going to ask about that as well because I was wondering, you know, you have all these cooperation provisions and yeah, how's, and, and it's going to look different as between two developing, uh, sorry, the EU and a developing country mm -hmm. versus, say, the EU and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned New Zealand's one being not quite as looking different than what's being proposed. And I think that was maybe people should talk to our negotiators um, <laughs> and see how they got it there. Yeah. Um, right. Sorry, I think we are over time. So I think I'm sure everyone is happy to continue the conversation in the break. So feel free to stay and chat, but we should probably formally draw the questions. <laughs>